Good afternoon, police. Um, my name is Ginelwe, and I will be the host for you for today. Um, before we start, I'll just like to thank you for everyone for joining um, the RSWS for today. Um, before we even start, can I just go through the housekeeping rules for everyone. Um, can everyone please switch off their cameras so that we don't disturb the network and also mute your mics so that we don't disturb the, the session as it goes. And then we're going to have a answer, question and answer session after the presentation where everyone can post their questions and they will be asked, answered or you may write your questions on the chat box. And then after the session, we will go through your questions and we will have a discussion later. Um, just to give a brief bio about our, our facilitator for today, his name is Dr. Ahmed Kato, and he's a post postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Applied Management in the University of South Africa. He recently completed his PhD in management studies, specializing in interpreting I, Sorry, can you please mute your mics? Thank you. Um, he also holds an MBA in accounting and finance, postgraduate diploma in finance management, of commerce, accounting. Uh, Dr. Ahmed has also published high quality research articles in accredited journals on venture capital, entrepreneurship, and SME development. In addition to his bio, he is also a co-supervisor of master's and PhD students, peer review, and editorial member of science journals of business and management, and assist, assistant editor of the Journal of Entrepreneurship and Small Business Development. He is also a professional member of Project Management South Africa. And then prior to, his, prior to starting his academic career, Dr. Ahmed had worked in the international, not for, not, not for the nonprofit organizations for over 14 years in leadership positions in various fields of the programs, grants and financial management and the, yes, financial management, sorry. Um, so Dr. Ahmed, thank you for accepting our invite and allowing us to, to be uh, here with you and just to uh, share some, for you to do, to, to, to just listen to you shed some light. Um, thank you, you may take the floor. Thank you. I hope you can see the slides. Um, not yet, Dr. Ahmed. Okay. Just a minute and I share the slides. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes, we can now. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, uh, Program Director. I think already you've uh, introduced me. I will probably go straight to uh, today's session. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who has joined this session uh, where we are going to uh, discuss uh, qualitative data te techniques. So we are going to look at uh, quite a number of things uh, that involve data collection techniques. <clears throat> 
And, and our structure for the presentation, we shall look at the background uh, of qualitative data collection techniques. And then we shall discuss the techniques for uh, qualitative data. Then thereafter, we shall look at qualitative research process. And then we shall proceed to highlights about how we can design uh, the questionnaires that is in the context uh, of qualitative data. <clears throat> and then we shall look at the sampling techniques. And then our last uh, session will be a step-by-step -step guide uh, to qualitative uh, interview analysis. Uh, let's move to the background. Uh, you may could I hear some echoes in the background. Those ones who have their mics open, please mute them so that we don't have interruptions as we uh, have this discussion. So you may find that academics uh, usually uh, find various things to research on, but this is basically after reading the literature and then they identify gaps or inconsistencies between a number of studies that probably require uh, the academics to carry out research and answer uh, those questions. But however, the choice of the research method is very critical when you are going to carry out any research, be it quantitative, qualitative, or mixed method. So in this regard, you realize that tremendously qualitative researchers uh, most of them are concur, uh, looking at the study of Sinida, that uh, highlights that figures are much exciting, but unfortunately, they hide more than they can reveal. So that is the quantitative method. It is a very good research method, but again, there are certain information uh, that that method cannot reveal. So in that uh, circumstance, then we come in and uh, use qualitative method. And when using qualitative method, uh, it is important uh, to select a good a qualitative research uh, that probably matches or exceeds the quantitative research in standing, significance, and then methodological uh, rigor. So therefore, qualitative research uh, is a multifaceted design and method of data analysis, uh, which is guided by the theoretical assumptions uh, of investigation. So it is very important that when we are carrying out uh, socioeconomic research, uh, we need to address questions like how and why uh, some of these research questions probably what arise, but basically this one is to uh, enable us, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to get a deeper understanding of the experiences, phenomena, and then uh, the context that regards uh, the study uh, we intend to carry out. <coughs> uh, let's uh, look at the techniques of qualitative uh, data collection. Of course, there are various techniques that are used. We have what we call ethnographic research. Uh, this one, basically, you intend to understand how people interpret their own world uh, in which they live and how they construct uh, some of the theories. Then we have diaries. Uh, this research diary is basically this one revolves on uh, books, journals, notes, and then description of stories. But what is important here is uh, when you are recording, you need actually to pay attention to uh, the chronological order because this method, you have to follow a chronological order or a sequence. When you are jotting down uh, like keywords and phrases that manifest as you are carrying out uh, the research. And then we have observation method, but this one is. You, when you launch us. Sorry. We have observation method. 
Uh, observation method, method is complementary because usually it is done with other methods in terms of uh, collecting data. And then we have uh, the prominent method that is usually used, that is interviewing and focus uh, group discussion. And then we have the case studies. But for purposes of uh, this presentation, we are going to discuss more about interviews and then uh, focus group uh, discussion. So in a nutshell, this is how it can be uh, presented. Uh, we can summarize that uh, when you are doing qualitative uh, research, you may use one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview method, or you may use a uh, focus group discussion. We have also the ethnographic research, case study research, then keeping record that we said, <clears throat> that is diaries, and then uh, the other method is uh, observation. So it is it's also important, uh, we need to uh, really uh, take care of the qualitative uh, research process. And the assumptions and views about how research should be conducted, uh, this one influences the research process. Because basically you need to look at the kind of research you are going to carry out. That one could be in terms of uh, the population. How easy are you able to get the information you need from the population? Are there restrictions or these bureaucracies? So that one uh, guides you in the kind of uh, process that you are going to, uh, to use. There are various approaches to qualitative uh, data analysis, but uh, largely five kind of standout. There are those ones that give six, seven, and eight, but at least uh, the five must appear in the process of carrying out uh, qualitative data. And number one is you need to prepare and organize data. I think we shall look at that in detail. The second one is review and explore your data. Then we look at, you need to develop the coding system. Uh, that is the most difficult part for carrying out qualitative research because if you don't code your data correctly, then you end up probably getting uh, information that may not be valid or reliable. So here you need to assign the codes and then identify the recurring uh, themes that come out as you are. Uh, carrying out the triangulation of data. Uh, this one can be graphically presented as, as we see in this uh, diagram here, sorry. Just a minute. So I think I should be now you have already selected uh, a topic that you are going to carry out. And I imagine most of the masters and doctoral students already they uh, selected that and even probably those one others got their ethical clearance. So what is important is you have to develop the research questions. And when you are developing the research questions, uh, there are a number of things that needs to be taken into consideration. You need to look at the length of the research it shouldn't be a length research where you are going to include probably like maybe 50 questions. So you need to look at the kind of target group you want to engage in the interviews, and then you develop uh, research questions that uh, suits their uh, preference or time. And these ones normally include the why and how questions, Okay. And then you also select appropriate methods and samples. We shall look at the sampling techniques that can be used. Uh, then in addition, you need now to collect data. So here you choose which method are you going to use for collecting the data. Looking at the various methods, 
uh, that you have seen in the previous uh, slide. So after collecting data, then you move to the next stage of analyzing uh, your data. So in terms of analysis, here you have to choose which software are you going to uh, apply in terms of analyzing data. Are you going to use Atlas TI? Are you going to use Evinvo? And there are also other various methods that you can use uh, in terms of uh, analyzing data. Then you develop a baseline. That is a summary of your analysis. Because if you have chosen, let's say, to use <clears throat> uh, Atlas TI, then you generate those reports from Atlas TI, and then you are able to uh, come out with themes that are outstanding, that can form uh, part of your either dissertation or the article uh, you are writing. And then you need to confirm the analysis. And then uh, the last stage, of course, you have written your article. Then you choose the method of disseminating the information. Are you going to carry out a webinar like this one? Are you going for a, an international conference? Or you are going to publish in accredited uh, journals? All those are various methods that we can use uh, in terms of uh, dissemination uh, of data. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Here we are looking at something's covering my one. <clears throat> uh, the design of the questionnaires. What do we need, need to take into consideration when we are designing uh, the questionnaires? Uh, the first aspect is the number of respondents. Because when you are going to carry out qualitative research, at the back of your mind, you need to know how many respondents are you targeting. For instance, if you are going to look at, let's say, you are carrying out research where you are investigating uh, the impact of supply chain man management strategies on the performance of uh, limited companies. So you need to know how many respondents or companies you are going to select. Are you going to select high profile uh, members of the company? or it is going to be a cross board where you look, look at uh, the CEO up to the gate man. And then you look at the size of the questionnaire. I think I, I discussed that. The questionnaire should not be so robust where it takes a lot of time for the respondents. It needs to be concise because most of our respondents are very busy people. So, when you design a questionnaire which has many questions, uh, you may get a low response uh, rate. And then uh, you also need to look at the statistical analysis and then uh, comparison. But however, you need also to look at which kind of uh, questionnaire are you going to use in terms of the questions you want to put across the, uh, the respondents. You may go by using hybrid open-ended open -ended questionnaires versus uh, closed-ended questionnaires. Here you may have structured, uh, for instance, you may ask the, the respondents, do you plan your lessons? That is a structured question, which is a yes or no. And then semi-structured, here now you are looking at is lesson planning always necessary, do you think? So this one kind of you need to add uh, some extra lines to explain. And then we have open-ended questionnaire. These are unstructured. A question like, what can you tell me about your lesson uh, planning? So this one has no limit. The respondents has to uh, explain depending on the kind of knowledge he or she has on the question you are raising. Oh, how do you describe the performance of the new HR manager? Those are uh, unstructured questions. Then we have close-ended 
a question like, do you think the new president elect of Kenya is going to do a great job? So these are just some of the questions probably that you can uh, include in the questionnaire as you are uh, developing it. And then we have uh, probe questions. This one kind of you need to uh, ask the respondent to explain further. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Of course, after the response, the respondent has what has given. Then why is that so? So this one, you are probably more information uh, depending on the kind of responses uh, that you have uh, received from the respondent. I think this one I've explained it in the, the slide we have just looked at. I'm just going to proceed to the next slide. <clears throat> so when you are designing the questionnaire, uh, it is also essential to take care of the ethical concerns, look at issues of intuition, take time, because how long is it, go is it going to take for are the respondent to complete that question. You may choose to have a pretest. You've developed a questionnaire, then you have a pretest like maybe uh, like for 10 people. If you want them to take like 30 minutes, then in that pretest, you can determine whether actually the questionnaire can take 30 minutes to, uh, to complete. Uh, if it doesn't take that, then you may sit down and redesign to may be reduced on the wording or the number of questions. Then you have also to be sensitive. There are certain questions that you need not be asked the questionnaire. For instance, if a, uh, a respondent maybe says, uh, in this interview, you need to be a bit fast. I have a patient uh, I need to attend to. Then you need not ask what, what is that patient suffering from? Because that is a sensitive question, it is person. Someone has already mentioned as a patient, just pray for that person uh, to get well soon. Then you look at uh, threats. There are certain questions probably that may create a threat to the respondent. For instance, if you are asking questions that may be, may be offensive to the supervisor, the respondent may not be able to answer that question. Then privacy also is important. Uh, when you are collecting data, of course, you need to look at the privacy uh, of the respondent, where if you are uh, reporting, then probably you have to uh, aggregate the information and then nobody uh, can be able to trace uh, the respondent's uh, identity. And then there are those irritating questions. You have asked a respondent a question. He has answered the question. I may be at a certain level again, you are repeating the same question. That one may be uh, irritating uh, to the respondents. And then uh, you need also to offer them uh, informed consent forms for them to sign. Uh, and then lastly, uh, of course, you need to have uh, ethical clearance certificate before you proceed uh, to collect data from the field. I think yesterday there was a session that was largely on ethical, career, uh, ethical conduct of carrying out research. I hope members uh, attended that. Uh, let's then look at uh, interviewing and focus group discussion. Like I pointed out earlier, of course, there are various methods of carrying out uh, qualitative data. But for this, for this, this, this debate, we are going to emphasize more on interviewing and focus uh, group uh, discussion. So when we are looking at interview method, this is an important uh, technique. Usually that is used in the form of research, it could be in structured or unstructured uh, interview. And when it is structured interview, of course you plan ahead. 
and you have a sequence of the questions uh, that you are going to ask the respondents. And of course, you have uh, expected answers uh, for those questions. Whereas for any structured, it is kind of open-ended. You allow the respondent to talk freely on questions that you've uh, addressed to them. And here the researcher uh, at times may ask leading questions focusing uh, on the, the discussion within uh, a particular time frame that is set out. But for group interviews, this one, of course, you look at a number of people. You may choose between eight, maybe to 12 uh, participants to uh, be part of the group uh, discussion. But the challenge with this one is in terms of consent, because if it is a group, if you are going to, you are seeking for consent, maybe to publish uh, information collected from them, that one becomes uh, a bit tricky to seek consent from all the members. So focus group discussions, uh, these are based on the theme of the research and they allow the respondents to support each other. Uh, in the event, maybe uh, one respondent forgets, then uh, another participant uh, can chip in to uh, keep the discussion lively. So let's look at uh, sampling. Of course, when you are going to carry out focus group uh, interviews or one-on-one one -on -one interviews, one thing which is important, uh, you have to select which sampling technique can you use when you are recruiting the participants. And the prominent uh, techniques that are used, we have purposive sampling. And purposeful sampling uh, is usually used by researchers to recruit participants who can provide uh, in-depth and detailed information about a phenomenon under uh, investigation. As the name suggests, it is for a particular purpose. So you select out uh, participants who have knowledge about the particular uh, topic that you are investigating. However, it is highly subjective and determined by the researcher in terms of defining what do you include uh, in the sample and what are you going to exclude? So here, each participant uh, needs to meet or needs to be considered for uh, the research uh, study. Let's see like an example where a student is invest investigating uh, the role of sustainable supply management systems as generators and co-creators of value addition for business and society. So you find that the, correct, uh, the selection criteria here, you are looking at active companies because you are not going to select companies that are out of business. Select those companies that are actively involved in supply chain management. Then on the other hand, convenient sampling, uh, this is largely used by researchers uh, to recruit participants who are easily accessible and convenient to the researcher. Let's say you are in Pretoria, you are carrying out research. So when you are using uh, convenient sampling, this one can be driven by the geog ge geographical location. Because you are residing in Pretoria, then you select out uh, participants that actually are resident of Pretoria. So in doing so, uh, this one kind of helps you to uh, recruit those participants at your convenience because you are going to minimize costs. And if it is face-to-face -face interviews, you can easily get uh, to their offices and you take up uh, the interviews. So how many participants uh, do we need to recruit for a qualitative research? Because in most cases, 
uh, students pick out uh, samples, let's say you are writing an article or your dissertation has been sent for uh, defense and then they say, or it is rejected because the sample unit was very small. So we need to understand uh, what actually is the ideal uh, sample that can be used for qualitative data collection. But of course, there is no definite answer or unbreakable and first rule for this question. Because there is nuisance at this point and considerable hang up on other dynamics of uh, the study. However, it is imperative that we offer some tactics to select a opposite sample of uh, the qualitative research. What I need to emphasize here, when you are selecting uh, the sample, the first thing is to look at the methodologies that are used uh, the, by the previous scholars. So this one calls to do some literature review and look at some of studies that are probably uh, related to the kind of study you are doing and what kind of methodologies we are used. So the key to finding the right number of participants to recruit, uh, you need to estimate the point at which you reach data saturation or when you are not uh, gleaning new information as you add. But of course, like I said, for you to get at that point, saturation shouldn't be uh, in isolation that you are the only one coming up with uh, that kind of sample. It needs to have a, cotton, uh, a linkage on previous uh, research. So here, guest and others, they found that in a homogeneous study, uh, using purposive sampling, uh, where many qualitative studies for them, uh, they looked at 12 interviews, uh, they found this one to be sufficient. But however, when you look at Hagman and Wick, uh, for them, again, uh, they looked at a sample of 20 to 40 interviews, and they recommended this one as uh, more suitable. Then Kato and Chuarone Soka, uh, in their sample, they targeted to interview 30 key respondents, but uh, the point of saturation was achieved at the 16th uh, interview. So looking at this literature, you can select your sample and then support it with uh, previous scholars, what they have used in terms of selecting the sample. So in a nutshell, if we look at the four that we have discussed here, it, we find that something between 12 uh, to 30 is ideal uh, for carrying out uh, qualitative uh, research. So after selecting the sample, of course, now you've, you've collected the data using the various methods and where we say it, of course you concentrate a lot uh, or we are concentrating a lot, a lot on interview and then focus group discussion. So let's get uh, an understanding of how do we uh, carry out interview data analysis. First of all, uh, collecting information here, the researcher is only at the beginning of the research process. And once information is collected, uh, you need to organize it and have a thought about it. Because when you are organizing data, you have to refer to the research questionnaires that you used. Look at the interview questionnaires and the kind of data you have uh, gathered. And in qualitative analysis, uh, here still we need to discuss more and get concerned with the meaning. And this can come uh, from many different sources. Of course, you are using interview method or focus group, but you need to uh, pay uh, keen attention on the notes and observations. 
uh, look at the interview tips. Could you please mute the microphone? I hear some echoes in the background. So if it was recorded uh, interview, then you need to look at uh, the transcripts because you are going to sit down and do the verbatim of the recorded uh, tapes. And this is also one of the difficult stages of qualitative uh, research. But after making the transcripts, you need to send them back. If it is applicable, you send them back to the respondents for validation to confirm that actually what you have transcribed is real, uh, that, is, that is the information that the respondents uh, delivered to you. And then look at maybe if you had information you needed like from newspaper clipping or personal journal, and then survey questionnaires, uh, where we, uh, we focus on analyzing data uh, from one on one uh, individual uh, interviews. So these are some of the uh, issues that we need to pay uh, attention to when we are carrying out uh, qualitative data analysis. So this is the detail here when you are organizing data. We need to look at valid analysis, which is immensely aided by data displays uh, that are focused enough to permit viewing a full data set in one collection and are systematically arranged uh, to answer the required search questions at hand. But of course, the best way to organize data, uh, you need to look at, uh, like I said, your interview uh, questionnaire. Because minus the interview questionnaire, you may not be able to organize uh, data in a proper manner. Remember that in the interview questionnaire, you have objectives. Like maybe you have objectives one, two, three, and then you have uh, questions that try to uh, answer those objectives. So as you are organizing data, it also should uh, move in that chronological order as uh, you spelled out the, uh, the objectives in the research uh, questionnaire. Then I identify and uh, differentiate the questions and align them to the specific research uh, objectives. But however, you need to look at the amount of data that is generated by one interview. Of course, this one can answer incredible uh, number of uh, questions. Because the challenge with interview data that you'll end up having quite a lot of information at your exposure. So what is important is how do you organize that data to make sense out of it? That is a stage that needs real uh, more uh, attention. So it is important to go back to the original question, questionnaires uh, that you are trying to answer. Then uh, you analyze data uh, that keeping in mind what you are trying to find out uh, in your research. Uh, such topic. Then stage two, here we are finding and organizing ideas and concepts. In this stage, you have to diagonalize the responses to each individual research questionnaire uh, with aim to make it easier to pick out uh, concepts and themes. But when you are picking out the themes, they need to be aligned on the research objectives. Because if the themes are not properly aligned, then you may not be uh, able to answer the research questions. Then identify uh, salient themes and recurring ideas and partners of belief uh, that are link, linked to uh, the settings. Of course, you have the themes. But as you are carrying out triangulation of data, you'll see some of the recurring themes that are appearing, and then you, uh, you code them. 
So this is intended uh, for you to have uh, how you can integrate your data during uh, that process. And when you are looking at the various responses, let's say for one particular question, it is important uh, to find out uh, particular words or ideas that keep on coming. So at the point when you find that you are not getting a uh, new information, that's what we say, that is the point of uh, saturation. It means even if you continue to carry out more interviews, they are not going to add on new information. At that point, you have to uh, go to, excuse me, to data analysis. Then coding and categorizing ideas and concepts. So once you have identified uh, outstanding phrases, you need now to come up uh, with how the interview has expressed himself. And then from the stories that you have uh, picked from the interview, organize these ideas into codes and categories. So after organizing these ideas in particular themes, that, that is the information you export. Either you are going to use Atlas TI uh, to now start uh, analyzing data or you are going to use a Vimvo. But you have to ensure reliability and the validity of data uh, in your findings. And one of the methods of ensuring liability, you said you need to look at data collected, then try to compare with the research questionnaires. You also compare with the recorded interviews. Because if the transcripts do not match at the recorded interviews, then that is a point of uh, trying to find out what we call the outliers probably have negative uh, data that doesn't align to uh, the questionnaires. And then find out possible and possible explanations uh, for your findings. In circumstances where you have outliers, you need again to engage uh, the respondents. Was it by chance or there was probably a recording that was not uh, sufficient. So you go back and get uh, additional information to clear the uh, outliers. Then number three, that we are still on that uh, interview data analysis, steps that we need to take into uh, consideration. <clears throat> Building overarching themes in data, here, each of the response categories uh, have one or more associated themes uh, that give a deeper meaning to the kind of uh, data you are collecting. And these different categories can be collapsed under one or overarching themes. So this one depends on the kind of objectives you want uh, to address. Of course, one objectives you may have like five questions, but if uh, there are overarching things that are coming up, you may end up uh, maybe collapsing that and you have like two or one, basing on the kind of responses uh, from the respondents. So here you need to test uh, your theory. Like when you go to quantitative, research, we test theories using uh, different uh, methods. You may use like ANOVA, you may use like regression, but here how you test the theory is for you to ident uh, identify the outliers. Because you are looking at information that doesn't match uh, what actually the questionnaire uh, was trying to answer. So when you find outliers, then, like I was saying, you need to go back and get more explanation or pull out those outliers from uh, the interview data, such that there are no discrepancies. 
uh, in what you are trying to gather. And then the fourth stage is reliability and validity. Uh, validity is the address with which the method measures what is intended at measure, and then it yields data that uh, actually represents uh, the information you need. Because if you compare the data transcripts, and then you go back and listen to the recorded tapes, and then there is matching of information, then that means uh, your data is valid. Then the liability, uh, this is a simple consistency of research findings, where you ensure that reliability requires diligent efforts and commitment at consistency throughout interviewing, transcribing, and analyzing uh, your findings. So at this level, it is inevitable to develop a systematic approach and maintaining consistent throughout the study process if you need to yield good data. So what we call good data, then it has to be reliable. This is data that is dependable. If you look at, or you go back and review your major goal of the research, then there should be consistency with the research questions. And when you match them, actually, you will see that they speak to uh, your major research topic. But in circumstances where data is not consistent, uh, you need to take an initiative to seek for possible explanations uh, for those uh, outliers, which I say information that doesn't uh, align to the recorded tapes or observation that you have made when you are carrying out research. So the dynamics of the interaction between the interviewer and the interview, uh, in most cases, influence the person's character of both parties. And there are differences probably in age, education, background. So when you look at those parameters, age, gender, education, and background, they have an influence uh, in the kind of data that you are going to collect. So if you are to raise like a question that, how old are you? You'll find that men will feel comfortable to, to answer that question. But usually it is better you give a range instead of uh, asking how old are you, then it could be a range. Are you between maybe 10 to 20, 20 to 30? That one becomes easy uh, for the respondent That's to answer such questions. So while belonging to the same culture of community, uh, researchers tend uh, to reduce at the interview where you need to uh, ensure that outsiders or many of these other factors still play a very important role and must therefore be recognized and taken into consideration uh, when you are carrying out uh, interview data uh, analysis. Then the other stage is validating and confirming uh, the findings. So here you have to carry out a triangulation. Findings are more dependable when they can be confirmed uh, from several dependent sources and their validity is enhanced uh, when they are confirmed. So when those two attributes are there, there is validity and reliability, then that one's an indication that actually uh, the kind of findings or information you've gotten is, uh, is dependable. And here we have different triangulation. We have triangulation from different sources. You may look at triangulation from different methods and then triangulation from different researchers. So you look at that one. If there are different sources, then you look at like the one we are emphasizing on the transcripts, then you look at the point where you feel actually 
information is not adding or you are not getting any new information. And then when you get to that level, of course, you, you stop uh, with data uh, collection. So what can we expect from triangulation? One is collaboration of the findings where they are both valid and reliable. Or you may get to the point where the data is inconsistent and conflicting. So when you reach this point where you have inconsistencies, uh, these uh, may require to find elaborate, elaboration uh, from the, the respondents. And then we have further triangulation. It is not uncommon to find things that were missed in the original data collection process, but uh, sometimes it means that our assumptions were maybe off and that we need to change our question to do uh, more research. So if you find more inconsistencies, that may, may mean either your research uh, questionnaire was not adequate, you need to go back and redesign it so that you are able to collect uh, data that is uh, not inconsistent. And then you also look at obtaining feedback from the participants. And the best way to examine validity of the research findings and of the researcher's interpretation is that uh, where the researcher has to go back and ask individuals who provided uh, the information. Then number five is finding possible and also explanations. Here you need to start by making a summary of findings and your themes. At the back of your mind, you ask yourself some of these questions. Are these findings what we are expecting? And are they based on the literature? Because you go back and look at your chapter two or chapter three, if it speaks to the findings. Where are there any major surprises in the findings? If it is a theory, you are trying to uh, investigate as maybe a theory. So if you are investigating that theory, then you look at uh, the findings. Do they speak to the theory or their deviations from uh, the theory? Let's say you are investigating agent theory, which uh, presupposes that uh, the, the principal has to supervise the agents, like in the case of the, uh, like the banks, they are giving you money and then they will be like the agents and they need to supervise the role. So you look at that, whether it is speaking to uh, the theory that is being applied, then how are they different or similar to what is stated in the literature of other similar studies? Of course, you don't want to be alone and you are isolated. Try to compare your findings with uh, prior scholars. What are some of the consistent issues that are rising up or which are some of the issues that are different? So you have to go back to the literature and compare your findings. And this may help you to find possible uh, explanations. Then also you need to look at whether these themes uh, help you to tie uh, the information you are looking at and also uh, can help you to probably get more information uh, about the idea uh, of the findings of your research. So that is basically uh, that about qualitative data analysis. I think the rest are just references. Uh, thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. Uh, I hand over back to the project director uh, for further guidance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you for the presentation. Um, colleagues, um, if there's anyone that would love to post a question or ask Dr. Ahmed about anything, you may take yourself off mute and then you may ask Dr. Ahmed your question. Thank you.
or you may maybe post on the chat box, then we'll get back to you. Can I come in? Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. It's just wonderful that I'm hearing this, uh, getting deep into this research and uh, the way we, we sometimes get confused. If we're always learning, this has come out very, very clearly. And uh, I'm just thinking in supply chain management where we move between numbers and uh, you know those general things. I think this has come out very clearly. I remember when we were talking about the ethics and I remember when you, you, you asked a question whether you guys, how corrupt are you? And then you get a wrong answer. I think the, Ahmed, you have just said it very nicely. And I, I want to just say that uh, as we move, move forward uh, and uh, you, you hear things like mixed research and complemented, complemented by this, uh, without this qualitative research, then even mixed research will be meaningless. But I think we need much more of this, especially in supply chain management, uh, where we're building up consensus. And uh, I think I was fearing qualitative research now can be comfortable. I just wanted to thank you that that was a great presentation, that's all. Uh, thank you, Reverend Charles, for your comments. Um, we've got a question on the chat box from, from Lizega. Um, Lizega says, what is the easiest or recommended software to use for analyzing interviews? Dr. Ahmed? Dr. Ahmed, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, yes, we've you. got a question. Did you hear the question? Yes. Uh, the question <laughs> about uh, the question about the software. Yes. I, I hear some echoes in the background. Uh, Prof. Emmanuel, can you please can mute remember? your thank you? All right, thank you. Uh, about the software. It depends on the kind of research you are doing. And the other thing is the knowledge you have about the software, because the prominent softwares that are largely used for qualitative research is Evinvo and uh, Atlas TI. But me personally, I would recommend Atlas TI because I've ever used it. And in terms of uh, interacting with uh, qualitative research, it is more usable. And looking at a uh, UNISA provides Atlas TI. So if you had to get more benefit, I would recommend uh, the students to go in for Atlas, uh, Atlas TI. Because if you go for Evinvo, that one may mean you need to uh, allocate more money for you to pay for that software and analyze your data. Yet for Atlas TI, you need to go to IT. They, uh, they can upload it on your machine and then uh, you are able to use it. And then the other, I think the other was uh, just a comment where Charles was saying, I think we need to move uh, to the level of mixed research. Uh, me, I'm a mixed researcher because when I was, I was doing my PhD research, uh, I used a uh, mixed, uh, mixed method. And of course, lately, many researchers are moving in in mixed research. You find that even qualitative, if you are going in content analysis, again, there is a point where you translate the content into uh, statistical figures uh, for you to get out uh, meaningful information. 
So maybe I think if we get a chance uh, in the future, then we can explore more on uh, mixed research because mixed research, that, that one combines quantitative and qualitative. And these two methods are complementary. If there is a shortfall or a disadvantage in uh, qualitative research, then quantitative will come in and iron out uh, that challenge. So if you use mixed research, then you are able to actually juggle around and you are able to deal with all the challenges uh, that may uh, arise from uh, your research. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for that, uh, that uh, informative answer. Uh, we have another question from Charles Kalinzi. Uh, he's just thanking you uh, for the presentation. And then his question is on the point of saturation when collecting data based on five regions. So his question is, do you saturate centrally or uh, regionally? Uh, thank you so much for that question. At the point of saturation, because that one now you've got into the, le the level of your data analysis. Unlike uh, quantitative uh, research, because for it already you sample out and you know this is a sample. But for qualitative, you go with a sample, you may start with like 10. But when you try to interview 10, you find, or you discover that actually they are giving very different information, you may increase the sample. That means you have not gotten the, the level of saturation. You started with 10, but as you are interviewing them, you haven't gotten to the point of where you are getting repetitive information or occurring of uh, information from the previous interview. So you may extend maybe to 15. But however, if you started with a higher sample, assuming you wanted to interview, let's say 20 people, you interview five, 10, 12, and then when you get to the 13th a respondent, you discover that there is occurrence or reoccurrence of information from the respondents uh, you interviewed earlier. So at that point, you have reached a point of saturation. So it depends on the number of uh, respondents that you are interviewing. It's not clear cut that you have a number where you are going to get a point of saturation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, there's a follow-up question from Charles as well. He's asking, how does inductive refinement work in qualitative research? Uh, inductive, that is a point where we are looking out for in-depth. So that one can be aligned to what we said, uh, if you are going to use purposive sampling, because you are selecting participants, but you need in-depth information. So there you are going to have some kind of unstructured questions. That is a point when inductive now what comes in. Because if you limit it, you may not be able to get uh, detailed information. So as long as you need more in-depth information, then you use that one to, uh, to cut out the interviews, the inductive method. Okay, thank you. Um, I see, before we continue on the chat box, I see there's a hand up from Pete Dallas. I hope I pronounced that well. Um, you may take yourself off mute and uh, pose your question. Okay, good afternoon, Doc. Thank good you afternoon. for your insightful presentation. I would like to know under what circumstances can a researcher use both a quota sampling technique and purposive, and how will it be applied? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, that great question. Uh, at a point where you use uh, quota sampling, that is when you have uh, like strutters. Let's say you are collecting information from uh, Let's say four, four provinces. So you first 
come out with those quotas, which are like the provinces. Pick out information. You are looking at Houghton, you are looking at maybe Free State, you are looking at Eastern Cape, Northern Cape, and you know which respondents are you going to interview. So after selecting them out, then you go down or you zero down now to particular information you need. Yes, you've selected out companies from all those uh, four provinces. But again, you look out for particular individuals. Are you going to interview graduate employees because they are more knowledgeable about the research topic you are doing? Or are you going to include more ladies than men? Are you going to include uh, employees who have worked like five years and above so that now you get to the level of what? Of the level of purposive sample because you are looking at particular features that you need to investigate further. But of course, when you look at it, you find that uh, purposive sampling becomes part of the quota sampling. Quota sampling is bigger than uh, purposive sampling you are zeroing down uh, to a particular group of uh, respondents that you need to investigate further. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, we've got a question from Mr. Ozayas Nube. Um, he says, um, of late, we are facing challenges around gate around gatekeeping when carrying out interviews. How can one navigate the distinction between respondent, that's the informed consent or the organizational experience, that's the permission letter? This has been a huge bottleneck in obtaining uh, ethics approval for many qualitative research researches. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Yes, it is a, a very big challenge, but the first thing that must be done is building th that collab. You need to have that collaboration because you before you get to the particular office where you are going to collect data, you need to have prior communication. Let's say you have, you've had communication either on phone or you are having communication by email with a person that actually you are going to have the interview with. So by the time you get there, they will ask you, do you have an appointment? Then already the person that has invited you to go to the office has prior knowledge that I'm expecting signs to come to my office. So at that level, you may not get any resistance that someone is uh, sending here away, that you are very busy, don't come in. But where we normally get challenges, that you just go walk in, you've not made an appointment with your respondents, and then you try to try your luck. Of course, you'll get resistance. Respondents want uh, researchers who have made prior arrangements. And that one makes it easier for you to collect uh, the data you need from uh, the particular respondent. So I would advise that you need to have the communication, pick, uh, get the email of the respondents and the phone number. That one can speed up the process and you are able to uh, easily work out what you need to do. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, there's also another one. Um, it says, what's your op opinion about the new approach of using quali qualitative positivism? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that question. I, I would feel that that one is also part of uh, qualitative research because when you are carrying out research, you need to investigate the community. Uh, that actually you are targeting. You know the kind of the social life they are living in, the kind of experience, the challenges they have. So by knowing the social uh, life of the community you are going to interview, that one helps you to uh, design uh, questions that are not going probably to, to get resistance. Because at times research 
comes out very okay or very well when you, you are interpreting the community where you are collecting data. But if the community has resistance, then uh, you may not be able to get information uh, that may support uh, uh, your study. So I feel that is something that can be incorporated uh, in terms of uh, qualitative data collection because this pattern pass of what of qualitative research. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, colleagues, should there be anyone else that has any comments or has a question, you may take yourself off mute while we still have time uh, so that we can hear your question or, or comment and then Dr. Ahmed will respond. Thank you. Um, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah, you. Okay. Uh, afternoon to the Ahmed, and thank you so much for your lovely presentation. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you, please. Okay. Um, I would like to make a follow up on the question of gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, in this respect, um, I'm referring to the gatekeeping from an organizational perspective which says that uh, the experiences of those that are being interviewed um, are based on company experiences and potentially their views or perceptions, um, confidential company experiences or company information. Yes. Therefore, before you can access the interviewees, you need a permission letter from the organization. Mm -hmm. But when you look at some of the objectives they are sort of looking for expert opinion based on the respondents being either experts or uh, or disciplinarians experts from a practice point of view or experts from a qualifications point of view as a researcher how best to navigate that that aspect um, I serve in the ethics committee and we are debating quite a lot on granting ethics for qualitative studies where there is no gatekeeper permission. So I, I, I'll pause here, um, Doc, and hear your thoughts around it. Yeah, uh, sh should I come in? Yes, sir, you can come in. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I hear you very well because uh, if, if we are to comply the, the ethical requirements, then uh, definitely there should be that uh, letter that is granting the researcher permission uh, to visit that organization. Because when you look at it in the, uh, the context of like the interview uh, research, you are carrying out interviews. Huh? It means that uh, the participants that you are going to, to interview, like the question of, excuse me, I think I hear echoes yes. from the background. Like the example was giving, you are trying to explore the impact of supply chain management strategies as generators of value for society and business. So if you are carrying out that kind of research, it is involving companies that are carrying out supply chain. So it will mean for you to access information or getting to the level of interviewing the respondents, certainly you need to get permission letters because you are not going to go to the company without the permission letters. Even if you are going to interview uh, lower staff, they have supervisors and certain companies have policies and regulations of releasing information to third parties. So if that letter is not granted, that means already you are violating the ethical standards. 
So I would really concur with you that that is a requirement uh, for all the qualitative researchers. It is, you may not have a shortcut unless the kind of research you are going to cut out is maybe content, content analysis because you are not going to uh, interview anybody. What you need is to visit the library, but also you find that even in the library, you are going to collect information or you want reports from the uh, maybe company employees still, you need a permission to access those documents. So I think the bottom line is that ethical clearance is required to uh, access uh, those companies that is supported by uh, the permission letters from the respective respondents. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, Kalish, is there anyone else that love, would love to post a question? Um, okay, it seems like no one at this point. Um, maybe we can close. Um, okay, before we can close, uh, colleagues, if should there be anyone that would love to have the presentation slides, you may please um, send an email, send a request to masipanv at iska.org.za, or you may go to our YouTube channel where you will receive uh, all the previous recordings as well as this current recording. Um, I think that'll be it. Um, also, I would love to really thank Dr. Ahmed for this insightful presentation. It was very comprehensive and we learned a lot from you. Um, oh, Dr. Prof. Imeno, I see you, your, uh, your, your mic is off. Would you like to say something? Sorry. Okay, I think that is a mistake. Um, no, as I was saying, Dr. Ahmed, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, it was really an honor to have you today. And I hope that everyone had gained a bit of knowledge from your presentation. Um, colleagues, thank you so much for taking time to be here and to join us today. Uh, I would really love you all to have a very um, wonderful evening going forward. And we will see you on the next webinar series. Uh, please stay in tune for the uh, posters that will be going out very soon. Thank you. Thank you. OK, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.